Thank you. Thank you for the very kind introduction. <laughs> and for staying to hear my talk about eyelashes and cubic poo. <laughs> so uh, I'll first say, after the show, um, I've written this book, How to Walk on Water and Climb Up Walls. Um, there's about some copies, and I'll be signing them outside. And also, I have a wombat poo uh, <laughs> that I'm going to let people touch and hold outside. Uh, and maybe you can take some selfies with it. So we'll do that after the show. So like uh, Petco said, I'm an Ig Nobel Prize winner. This is me at Harvard University uh, wearing a toilet seat on my head and wearing a wombat poop costume, um, accepting this fine award. It's for research that makes you laugh and think. And uh, that's really my goal today, to make you see that strange things can have deep meaning inside them, and that we shouldn't always judge things based on their appearance. So my Ig Nobel Prizes are the absolute peak of my career, the very top of my career, and now I want to show you the very bottom of my career. Um, Brian, will millions this is of me on Fox News. I was at a research, conference when my university called me today, to say, you need to turn on this TV channel days. Me because now to break it all down for us, they're starting to talk about your work. So uh, this is a Senator Jeff Flake. Um, he basically created this game show wheel, wheel and he put so all the si the several scientists' names and research on the wheel. And once they spun right, the wheel, the wherever it landed, they would start criticizing our work. Well, that's uh, part of a 390,000. And we didn't get any money. National Science Foundation study. In fact. That year, uh, this is a 2000, uh, 2016, I was on this list three times. That means I was responsible for 15% of the entire country's most wasteful work. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's not easy, it's not easy, not easy. Um, and I'll tell you about all those works today, and you can be the judge for yourself if it's really wasteful. So, I've always been interested in science, and I see a lot of people brought kids downstairs. Since I was this age, I've always thought that nature has wonderful secrets. But it wasn't until I was really encouraged by my parents, that's my father, he's a chemist in Illinois. It was not until I was encouraged by my parents to try to learn tools that I could use to understand science. And for me, I learned those at MIT. This is me um, getting admitted by mistake to MIT. Um, and this is me eight years later, when I left with a degree in engineering and mathematics. So now I had the tools to actually understand how animals started to move. Um, this is me back in graduate school. You can see I was a sharp dresser, even then, wearing used clothing. And uh, my first research um, has a lot to do with the churches that you see in Sofia. It's about how you can accomplish miracles. So how can you actually walk on water? How can you do that? Well, if you're very, very small, it's quite easy. There's about a thousand insects all over the world called water striders. This is them. You look, think it's on land, but that's actually the water surface. And they don't just walk, but they can wrestle, jump, fight. I call this video two parents having a discussion. <laughs> you see, their entire bodies are water repellent. On the right, you see this is a very close-up image of what their body looks like. A single leg is about the thickness of your human hair, but if you zoom in, that leg is coated in tens of thousands of little hairs. Every square millimeter has 10,000 hairs. It's basically the furriest animal you've ever seen. Maybe you go to the swimming pool, you see some very furry people. This is even furrier than them, far furrier. So furry that it takes water energy to actually penetrate into the little cracks. But because they have so many hairs, water doesn't want to do that. As you can see from this uh, image, that's a leg on the water surface. They don't actually touch the water. They actually have layers of air that they're floating on, and the air is actually supporting their weight. So um, there's a lot of intersection between science and art. And this is the, one of the first photographs I ever took. Um, I call this photo Icarus. Um, for the basically father-son duo that climbed so close to the sun that they actually wings melted. This photograph is taken by taking blue dye and putting it all over the water. 
And every time the insect roads its legs, you can see the fluid flow patterns they generate. So this is purely a photograph that we take of an insect walking on water. But it was the first image to show that these, how these legs actually work. So it, it looks like these insects should be like a rowboat, right? Like some kind of rowboat with an oar. But what's strange about it is if you were to go to a lake and try to row with like two uh, chopsticks, two little sticks, you wouldn't get very far. How do these insects, how can they generate that beautiful pattern behind the wake? Well, what they do is they actually push down on the water surface, and that generates a dimple, sort of like a divot in the water. And this air pocket pushes back on more water. So they use their legs as the oars and the dimples, these uh, air pockets, as the blades. And that allows them to make oars whenever they need it. And uh, this is on the cover of the fluid mechanics textbook I teach with in college. I teach other mechanical engineers based on, based on this work. So one of the themes throughout the talk today is that we don't look at nature just because it's beautiful or interesting, but also because it can make new kinds of devices. So what you see is the insect on that we're looking at is on the very top, and the bottom, that's actually a machine. It's the first water-walking robot, a boat that sits on the water surface, and when it rows, it doesn't actually penetrate water. Just like these insects, it stays dry on top, and it pushes the water surface, like the skin of a pudding. Just by gently deforming it, it can actually move without getting wet. It's made possible because the whole robot is only 0.3, uh, 0.3 grams. So some of you are seeing these very small insects and are getting very jealous. And you're saying, hey, I want to walk on water too, like these insects. Well, Leonardo da Vinci also wanted to walk on water. This is him with his water walking devices. Uh, ninjas, they wanted to be able to sneak up on people, so they also invented these devices. Um, but what they should have really learned, looked at, is these lizards. So I showed a picture of Jesus Christ in the very beginning. This is also known as the Jesus Christ lizard in Brazil. Um, that's a high-speed video, and this is it in real time. So this water is actually very deep. It is, struggles to stay stable because the, it's very, very slippery on the water surface. But what it's doing, it's hitting the water so hard the impact force, the same force a diver feels when they dive into water, is hitting it so hard that it actually supports its weight. It can support its weight by running very, very fast. And that's how it escapes predators. So I showed you two ways to walk on water. If you want to be like the insect, the problem is that insect weighs as much as a paperclip. It's hundreds of thousands of times less than you. So if we want to use surface tension like the insect, you need to have a foot that's about 10 kilometers uh, in, in diameter. So that's almost as big as like a Sophia central, central part. So it's not possible to use surface tension. The other possibility is you use the force of driving the water downward. Um, and there's been some div devices that, that do that, um, but uh, they generally work kind of like propellers and boats. They don't really use the person's force. Because if you were to drive water at that speed, you need to have generate 30 times as much power as your muscles can allow. And that has to do with the fact that we are just so heavy. So uh, insects are just one part of the story, but um, the thing about nature is that it surrounds you everywhere. Even all those like stray cats I see everywhere in Sophia, they can provide inspiration for building new kinds of devices. So the stray cats you see, there's one of 30 species of cats that evolved all over the world. And one of the things that cats do very well is sleep, but also they also stay very, very clean. How do they stay so clean? It's because about four hours every single day, they're grooming themselves. Um, and sometimes they groom people too, like that bottom, that guy looks like he's not, um, uh, is not being injured, but actually probably is very, very painful. Has anyone been licked by a cat before? Yeah, it doesn't feel that good, right? And why is that? And that's because of what their uh, tongues are capable of. So let me, let's, let's show this video first. So the difference between my tongue, this tongue, and the cat tongue is the fact that it's covered in tiny little spikes. Every cat, from your kitty cat to your lion, has 400 spikes that we call papillae. The tongue comes out of the mouth every single second, expands like a uh, balloon, and these spikes open up and start basically Sweeping, sweeping through the fur. So we actually, in our lab, 
we don't just look at house cats, but we look at cats all around the world. Um, in Tennessee, we get cats, bobcats, cougars, snow leopards, uh, tigers, and even lions. That lion tongue is as big as my head. But they all use the same principles to stay clean. And one of the things about the cats is that every time it does this process of cleaning itself, it uses very, very little water. So when you take a shower, use maybe um, 100 liters of water in five minutes. But when a cat rooms itself over four hours, it only uses three tablespoons of saliva. How can cats only use such a little amount of water to stay clean when we're wasting so much? The secret is how these papillae actually work. So this is with 3D scanning. So this is actually a tool that every elementary school has now and 3D printing. We can basically remove one of these papillae from the cat's tongue and we can scan it. And this is the shape it has inside. It's not actually just a pin, but inside is like a skateboard ramp, uh, a sort of a curved area that, that seems to be it's good for trapping things. And what is it good for trapping? It's good for trapping saliva. Saliva is like a kind of an all-purpose detergent. It goes through the fur, it is a rinse cycle, it dissolves blood and oils. And the amazing thing about saliva is that it automatically gets pulled into the papillae. So that's me just holding a drop of a water next to it. And just because the papillae is so small, by capillary action, gets sucked in into and gets very stuck. The width of these papillae is exactly the same height th thickness of the cat's hair. So it's basically like a lock and key mechanism. The cat doesn't waste any water because all the saliva is trapped inside the individual papillae and it rubs them on individual hairs. So each hair gets its own bath. It doesn't drip any and it just releases it and captures it again. So only with three tablespoons and coat its entire body. So when I saw this, this cat tongue, I was really amazed at the time because if you go, uh, if you co I comb my daughter's hair a lot, but if you use combs, they're very different from the cat's tongue. They're made of stiff bristles, um, they're not curved and not on sort of soft substrates like this. So we decided to patent a cat's tongue. This is a tiger grooming brush um, that basically, when you groom with it, it causes, it pr uh, gives you less hair loss and uh, it basically feels uh, softer over your individual hairs. And the reason is because as you pull over the hairs, the uh, bristles can actually move, and they're not rigid. And the other thing we discovered is that they're really easy to clean. If you take your typical hairbrush, you'll notice that hairs get stuck in the little parts of them, and because the hairbrush is so rigid, it's very, very slow to clean and remove these, these parts. But instead, this cat-inspired hairbrush is similar to what cats do. In the middle of the night, the cat, you'll hear this sound. What it's doing, it's basically rubbing its tongue against the mouth, and any time of night, 1 a.m., it can just throw up into your slippers or into the bed or into the carpet. Anywhere, it can, anytime, it can make this cat furball and clean its tongue. And this is absolutely critical for them because otherwise they would, they would have to throw away their tongue. And, and we just can't do that with those products. So is anyone here a dog person? Anyone here like dogs? So I've got a dog story for you. Um, this is, uh, this is very similar to the time when my, uh, I met my wife. She had this uh, poodle with her uh, when we first, uh, first met. Dogs have amazing abilities to remove water. Um, so you think it's just a cute little action, but if a dog, a dog about this size, about 40 pound dog, uh, uh, let's see, 20 kilogram dog has about a half kilogram of water stuck in its fur. If you were to use the heat to remove that water, the dog would actually have to use one-third of its daily energy just to heat itself and dry itself off. So in, in, basically, in order to keep itself uh, dry, it's evolved these super-fast shaking maneuvers. You've probably never seen this before. This is a mouse. It's shaking 30 times per second. So every single second, um, every time you blink an eye, it's shaking 10 times already. It's very, very fast. This is probably the fastest animal shaker in the world. It's also, it's also pretty cute. Um, so th what's amazing about these animals is how much forces they're subjecting themselves to. If you try to shake your head as fast as possible, you're only going to get twice per second, and you're going to give yourself a headache. This rat is shaking itself 15 times per second. And it does so, it's got to protect its eyes. So you see it's closing its eyes, 
Because if you calculate the amount of force that is to shake 15 times per second, it's about 50 times Earth's gravity. That means, for you, it means like if I have 50 people sitting on my chest. That's what the rat feels. And um, this is much more than a car crash. So that's why it basically has to keep its eyes shut so its, its eyes don't get damaged and look like the bot people on the bottom. This bear, so it turns out the bigger you are, the easier it is to shake. Um, uh, because you don't have to shake as quickly. This bear shakes about as fast as we do, about twice per second. Um, and that's because as you get bigger, you have a bigger radius, and then you basically don't have to shake as higher frequency to get the same speed. So the water drops just fly off quite easily for him. So why can the dogs shake off and we can't? Why do we have towels? Why can't I just go after the shower and go... <laughs> The reason is because of our skin. If you've ever noticed, this is a big mystery, but why animals, they have very loose skin on their necks and their backs. That st straw is actually the back of the dog. So every time a dog shakes, the back goes all the way to 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock. It's swinging 90 degrees each side. That's far, far um, more than the bones can, sh can shake. So... These are two rats that we uh, film in x-ray. You can see the backbone is very stiff. It really stays in the same place. This has a, be a good for a music video. But th these animals show that if you basically can move, have very loose skin, you have a whipping action. You make the speed times three, and the forces go up by a factor of 10. So that's how they can get uh, dry so quickly. So based on our work, um, there's been some computer scientists that are basically building the next Disney movie uh, where you'll be able to see dogs trying to shake off. Uh, because this is actually a very difficult problem to calculate. Um, each of the individual hairs will start clinging together. Um, so they're actually based, basing a lot of these um, imageries based on um, some of our calculations. All right, let's just skip this one. So I've got uh, th about three stories left um, to tell you. Um, uh, and it does, this one's going to get a little gross. So some, some people might actually be a little disturbed. But um, in America, we have these uh, things called fire ants. You don't have fire ants here, right? Fire ants are called that because the sting feels like you got burned. Um, they leave a very venomous sting. Um, and they also build these structures. So... So um, this is how we actually collect fire ants. If you drive down a highway in Georgia, you see a big mound of soil. What you do is you dig with a shovel, and you put the shovel with the ants into a bucket. And um, the problem is you have ants mixed with soil. So you've got those all mixed together. How are you going to separate them? Well, the way we do it is we simulate rain. We basically drip water into the bucket, drop by drop, and the next day we come back. And what do you have on the surface of water? Um, this is not rose oil. <laughs> this is fire ants. Because the fire ants have pulled their young babies and each talked to each other and left the underground colonies and basically went to the water surface. The reason they can build these structures is because each ant is tremendously strong. One ant can support about 50 to 100 times um, its weight. And they do that with tiny little sticky pads. Every time you see an ant walking on the ceiling or upside down, is because it leaves very small drops of glue. Each of those little blue spots you see are all the drops of glue it can use to connect to its neighbors. The water starters you saw in the very beginning of this talk are an example of Gore-Tex. By having a very rough surface, they prevent water from penetrating, and they stay dry. Now, these fire ants are the same thing. Oops. Oh, sorry. Uh, let's show this one more time. These fire ants are the same thing. What you see here is actually inside is completely dry. That's, that uh, glassy surface is an air pocket. It's a bubble. So this raft is completely dry on the inside, even though I'm trying to drown it. So we use the ants' uh, own abilities to study them. Um, the rafts, and uh, if you look at them in nature, they're very strange shapes. Um, but we can actually make them perfect spheres just by using their own ability to cling to each other. Let's just show this one more time. So the ants, they naturally cling to each other. We flash froze this whole raft, and we showed that 99% of their legs are attached. They really become 
their own super organism. And you can take these and you can throw them at people. <laughs> but uh, if you throw them at people with beards like Petco, they're going to be in big trouble because your whole body is going to be covered with ants for hours. You can never separate beard from ant. Not possible. Not possible. This is very dangerous. I, I wouldn't suggest. Don't do this at home. Have I tried it? Uh, yeah, we have did an ant snowball fight, but luckily I don't have I don't have beard, so I'm I'm pretty safe. <laughs> so that ball of ants you see is not its natural shape. What the ants have is a design. They want to plan to build a raft that's basically very very flat, so basically it doesn't uh, doesn't break and it doesn't get turned over. It's very stable. So the rafts, when you put them on the water surface, they always build these two layers. And moreover, this raft is not just good for floating. It's very, very robust. So this is us getting angry at the ants. You can see you can try to squeeze them. They're 80% air. And because of their muscles, they'll spring back. So that's why the US Army actually paid us to do this research, because they're interested in sort of these very resistant, uh, buoyant uh, materials. Um, this is based on the springiness of salad greens. Um, and, uh, um, and on the right, this video on the right is a, uh, oh, sorry, let me do one more time, uh, one more time. This video on the right shows uh, the penny falling through ants. Um, so this is real time. Uh, we drop, if you drop, imagine a raindrop hits the ant raft. It's not going to just sit there and make the ants wet. The ants will actually move out of the way of the penny and form basically a hole, allowing any kind of objects to basically penetrate this raft without damaging the structure. So basically, the ants are both like a solid and like a fluid. If any of you like to eat string cheese, pizza, remember this movie. <laughs> so the ants, they're very good at holding onto each other. In fact, when they conduct warfare, they'll actually tear each other apart. But they're smart enough when you basically pull them apart not to, not to hurt each other. Don't worry, no ants are actually hurt in this video. You can take an ant and throw it off a building or an airplane. Because they're so light, they basically just float to the ground, and they don't, they don't get damaged. So, so based on what we found, um, actually computer scientists and roboticists everywhere, they're basically trying to emulate ants to build the no, sort of next, um, next super robot. So on the, on the right, uh, basically this ant raft is actually reaching towards land. It can sense land, and it can reach toward it and build an anchor. Um, and the dream of robotics, uh, the grand challenge is to build a bucket of parts that you just jump on the ground like these ants, and it'll construct uh, these useful bridges. So I've got two stories left. Um, these are my Ig Nobel Prizes. Um, does anyone know what that is on the left? That's actually female elephant. This is a female elephant's urine. Um, and those are urine from other animals. So I started doing this work um, when I was changing a lot of diapers. Um, my kids were really young. And uh, I was, uh, there was one time I was changing diapers and I got peed on by my kid. And uh, when a ki when the thing is that when a child starts peeing, you cannot do anything. You just have to sit and wait. You can sort of turn them in different directions, but it's just going to keep on coming out. You can try that at home. And well, the thing I noticed about kids is that they're very small, but they have a huge amount of pee, a lot more pee than I expected. And I, I always thought that if you're smaller, you should have less, you should pee faster, and if you're bigger, you should pee slower. So to understand why that is, <laughs> um, I took my undergraduate students, so I only take the students who want to join my lab who want to be medical doctors, and I say, I will only give you an A if you basically do my research. So <laughs> this is actually the one in the middle wearing the boxer shorts. He actually is a doctor now. He's a professional urologist. That means he looks at this stuff like all day, <laughs> every day. He just can't get enough of uh, these pee, this pee. Um, so I asked him to go to the zoo, Atlanta Zoo, and don't come back until you've told me how long every animal takes to pee at the zoo and how much pee it has. Just a very simple question. So this is what he came back with. So this is the first time at ratio, first time in Sofia, that you're going to see rats peeing. So in real life, these are tiny gumballs, very small. On the screen, they're probably big as beach balls. 
The thing about a rat is it actually doesn't have enough pressure to beat surface tension. The surface tension of water wants to push it back into its body, so it can only push out very slowly. In fact, female rats, the mothers, have to lick the rats to make sure that they pee right, otherwise they can't pee on their own. So they'll die without their mothers. This is probably similar to what you did in the bathroom before the talk. Um, hopefully this is not like you. Um, this is a lot of pee. This is uh, basically a whole bucket of pee. And you've got to get ready for this next one. This is my favorite video of all time. <laughs> favorite video because this is part one and part two of my students' research, all in the same video. That's actually a solid poo falling a whole meter. So the students came back with these experiments, and they said, oh, I don't think what we have is very interesting. But I said, no, this is very interesting, because look at how big these animals are. You know, this elephant is 5,000 kilograms. That five, that's, has, and the elephant has a bladder of 20 liters. So to get that number, we actually had to take a garbage can and put it underneath the elephant and capture the huge amount of 20 liters, this huge amount of pee. It's, in fact, 100 times as much as your dog. You would expect it to would take longer, but all these animals have about 21 seconds to pee, even though it's 100 times more stuff. How is that possible? If you look at history, people have been wondering how to get fluid out of basically large vesicles for a really long time, especially alcoholic beverages. So, for example, beer, wine, you don't want to put a hole on the top. You want to put a hole on the bottom because the weight of all that fluid will actually push it out faster. And so the animals, they actually have this thing in their body called a pee pee pipe. A female elephant has a meter long pee pee pipe. That's female elephant. And that pee pee pipe makes the bladder look artificially taller so when it comes out, it's much, much faster. It's actually the speed of about five shower heads when it comes out of elephant. So if you don't believe me, um, you can do this experiment at home. That's a rhino, a human, and a dog bladder with a pee-pee pipe of the right width and height underneath it. And don't worry, that's just yellow water. We didn't actually use real urine. So basically, you've got so much difference in fluid, but because of this pee-pee pipe, you can basically get them all out at the same time. So we were... Um, we were so amazed at this uh, work that uh, we wanted this Japanese game show. And these, uh, this Japanese doctor was so amazed that he actually used this, to me this method to measure uh, 2,000 Japanese people. And he found that before they used lasers to measure the speed of urine, but now just by measuring your time, you can figure out how strong your bladder muscle is. And if your bladder muscle gets weak with age, you can see your pee pee time go up higher and higher and higher. So next time you go to the bathroom, make sure you bring a stopwatch and check, if you're peeing for three minutes, you probably need to go see a doctor. I'm telling you that. That's the, my, my advice to you. Okay, so this is the last, the last story about our, the cubic poop I'll bring outside after the talk. Um, so this is the actual poop. That's a 3D scan, and, the, and it shows you it really does have six sides. If you want to play games of chance, you can actually paint dots on it. We, we do that in my lab, figure out who does lab cleanup, um, and take bets. <laughs> Where do these animals come from? What magical place? They come from Maria Island, the basically bottom southeast part of Australia. And they are very fast, very, very fast. How big is that animal? So Scott's an average person we got to see this one more time. Scott's the average person, but their bodies are about the size of a toddler, but because they dig all the time, they're very, very strong. So they run incredibly fast, and they're very hard to ca catch. So our collaborator had caught a good number of them for our experiments. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of them also die at roadkill. So they get hit by cars. Um, they're extremely cute. Um, they're the world's second most cutest animal. Uh, number one, of course, is the panda. But number two, they are definitely very, very, very close. So they're the wombats sniffing the air, seeing if there's any cute wombats around. There's the baby wombats. They're called joeys. That's what they do all day. Itch and eat grass. When they're not doing those two things, um, they're doing this. 
So wombats are marsupials. They're just like a kangaroo. A kangaroo has a pouch, but because the wombats are digging all the time, their pouches actually face towards their butts. So every time they poop, they actually poop on top of their kids. So if you kids are complaining about how hard your life is, as a wombat, it's much, much more difficult. So that's called babysitting and bathroom cleaning, multitasking. So they make 100 cubes per day, and they don't put them everywhere. They only put them in special places they call latrines. They climb on the tallest object their short bodies can go, which is like a rock or a stump, because they have short little legs. They go on top of the rock, and they leave 20 cubic feces on top. So what we think has happened is millions of years ago, it released a cylindrical poop, and it rolled down the rock. And over time, what we think happened is that they use these as communication, as a flag, to say, this is my home, don't come here. And it evolved an ability to keep the poop on top of the rock. And to do that, you need to have flat sides. You need to have something that's not going to roll. So if you ask Australians, the number one reason why wombats have cubic feces is they say it's like spaghetti. If you take spaghetti and you put it through a dye, something that's hard, you push it through, it's going to make a mold. That's how you get lasagna. That's how you get stromboli. So is a wombat anus like spaghetti? If you look very closely at these fat legs and this anus, it's pretty much very circular. So it has actually nothing to do with the anus. Uh, this next picture may shock you. This is a poor wombat that was killed uh, by a car, um, and Scott collected it, and he sent this wombat to us in the United States. Um, yeah, this is pretty shocking. Um, but hopefully it, it died very quickly. Its body has 10 meters of intestines. Like I said, it's one third of our size, but their intestines are the same length as an hu adult human. And inside those intestines, the top, you see grassy, like a slurry, yogurt. That's what you expect in like a cow. But near the end, you get something very magical that happens. This sort of grass gets flat faces, it darkens, it becomes 6% water, so that's 20% less water than us, and you get flat faces and edges. So the reason why it's the same length has to do with the way it dries. It dries very slowly. And there's not the first time in the world that you get geometric shapes. If any of you get the pleasure to go to Ireland, the Ireland uh, shore in uh, Giant's Causeway is covered in hexagons. And that's because the lava there has cooled so slowly that the heat emanates, the lava causes the ground, as it cools, it causes the ground to shrink. That generates stress. And if it shrinks slowly enough, you'll get geometric structures. So the wombats actually keep their poop in their bodies for about five days. So it's about twice as long as a human. So this is us hanging the wombat intestines from the ceiling of my lab during Christmas. We were basically, I was, had this hunch that the faces were all facing the same way. And it turned out I was correct that they're not just random. The body of the wombat has a map that tells them where you're going to make the faces and where you're going to make the corners. This is real. This is not, uh, this is not made up. This is a, NHK made a cartoon of basically what the intestines look like. It kind of looks like chocolate with like a, a, a roll on top. But every day, even right now, your intestines are contracting. It's called peristalsis. About 20,000 times for a human is going to contract back and forth, and about 50,000 times for a wombat. It looks like this. And almost all animals, people thought they had basically the same stiffness everywhere. But wombats, we measured, they've got two bands, very, very stiff bands. It's like you basically burn those areas so they're four times as stiff. And if, when those bands contract, they basically have basically four times as much force to generate these corners. So you imagine these two very stiff edges, they contract first, they generate those corners, and the edges in between in the other places are far enough away that they get left behind. So by a combination of these two processes, you get cubic poop. The actual poops on the left, those are the ones we collected from the island, they're actually far more cubic than our models can predict, but uh, we still get the four corners. So if you ever have strangely shaped poop, like cubes or rectangles, it's because you need to see a doctor. <laughs> 
But uh, one of the big um, reasons for the, one of the big symptoms of colon cancer is actually stiff colons. Um, and that causes people's feces to be very strangely shaped. So basically, a wombat has, a hu has basically a living example of stiff, organized colon that gives them particular shapes. So thanks for being a great audience. I hope you enjoyed seeing what nature has to offer. Um, I'll be uh, in Hawaii in September and then uh, in California, and I'm happy to sign your books on the outside. Thanks a lot.